Hello and welcome to another edition of the 11th OVC. This week, what we're going to be talking about is we're going to be diving into the primary records again. I know in previous episodes, Brandon Lewis was able to go through some photos, through some poems, through some other things. Uh, today, what we're going to do is we're going to introduce the ORs, uh, the official records, uh, the official reports, whatever you want to say, uh, that were published later on in uh, you know, significantly, I mean, decades after the war. The one thing I want to introduce is when I was doing some research, for uh, Spanish Fort, Blakely, uh, more of the kind of Louisiana Gulf area type official records, I came across, ironically, a report from William O. Collins of the 11th Ohio Volunteer Cavalry stationed at Fort Laramie, talking about his last, basically, winter at the fort. Oh, well, I mean, Fort Laramie and, and the Overland Trails. So what we're going to do, those of you who aren't familiar with the ORs, uh, especially from a primary research standpoint, uh, you can argue they're not a primary record, uh, but they're definitely one of the best research tools that Civil War historians have. Uh, and you can find them online. You can find them text searchable PDFs. You can search Cornell University. I mean, uh, I think Oklahoma Press. Uh, I mean, there's, there's websites around that have them. So uh, what we're going to do is we're going to just go right into it, give you an idea of, of the official record, the official report in the winter and early, early spring of 1865. So without further ado, let's listen to it. Captain, I have the honor to report that about four o'clock on the evening of Saturday the 4th instant, I was informed by telegraph that Mud Springs, a telegraph station 105 miles east of Fort Laramie, was attacked by Indians. There were at Mud Springs Station at that time nine soldiers and five citizens, one of the latter connected with the telegraph company and the others herding stock in the vicinity for Masters Creighton and Hull. I immediately ordered Lieutenant Ellsworth, commanding Company H, 11th Ohio Volunteer Cavalry, then at Camp Mitchell, a post 50 miles east of Fort Laramie and 55 miles west of Mud Springs, to proceed without delay with all the men he could spare to the relief of Mud Springs Station, to travel all night and, if possible, reach there by morning. He obeyed the order promptly and was at Mud Springs by daylight the morning of the 5th with 36 men, making the distance in 12 hours without stopping. In the meantime, I left Fort Laramie about 7 p.m. on the 4th instant with about 120 men, consisting of detachments of different companies of the 11th Ohio Volunteer Cavalry and part of Company D, 7th Iowa Cavalry Volunteers, being all that could be mounted and spared from Fort Laramie. My command traveled all night and reached Camp Mitchell during the forenoon of the fifth instant. The night was severely cold and several men were so much frozen as to be unable to proceed any farther. After a short rest, I took 25 men and went rapidly forward, reaching Mud Springs about two o'clock the morning of the sixth instant. The balance of the command followed under Captain Fouts, 7th Iowa Cavalry, and reached Mud Springs about eight o'clock the same morning, having made 105 miles in 36 hours, including stoppages. The small party with me made the same distance in 17 hours actual travel and 30 hours including the delay at Camp Mitchell. I found that the Indians had been in great numbers on Pole Creek on the third instant, that on the fourth they began to appear about Mud Springs, attacked the station, stole the stock there, consisting of about 15 ponies and horses belonging to citizens, one mule and three horses belonging to the government. Also the cattle herd of Masters Creighton and Hole, which was on Rankins Creek about four miles distant, that on the morning of the fifth, soon after the arrival of Lieutenant Ellsworth, they had appeared around Mud Springs in large numbers, seemed surprised at the increase of men at the station, and after a little firing, their attack ceased, but many continued in sight on the hills all day. At daylight on the morning of the sixth instant, they began to come over the bluffs from all directions, and about the time of the arrival of the main body, they commenced a desultory firing and made efforts to cut off some of the party coming in. It was evident that they had come to take the post and expected to do so. The men and stock were fatigued by night travel, all chilled and many frostbitten. The station is also utterly indefensible, being surrounded by hills and knolls full of gullies, enabling the Indians to ambush and creep upon us 
at points where they could not be reached by a cavalry charge. Shortly after our main body got in, they attacked us in force and with great boldness. The suddenness of the attack, the condition of the men, and the character of the ground interfered with proper discipline and system on our part, and the fighting at first was rather miscellaneous. We found it necessary to imitate the Indians, get under banks, and creep up to favorable positions, watch for an Indian's head, shoot the moment it was shown, and pop down at the flash of his gun. The men got quite handy at this game and soon made any ground occupied by the Indians too hot for them. It was common to see a soldier and an Indian playing Bo Peep in this manner for half an hour at a time. At one time, there were some 200 Indians behind a hill and in its ravines, where they could come within 75 yards of the buildings at the station. From this point, arrows came in showers, the Indians shooting them, keeping entirely out of sight. The arrows were apparently discharged at an angle of about 45 degrees, making a curve and descending upon us about the same angle. Many horses and mules and some men were wounded in this manner. It became evident that this point must be cleared, and arrangements were made for two parties to charge, one on foot to drive them out, the other on horseback to head them off, when the Indians, finding half a dozen rifles leveled at each head that was shown, abandoned this position. We immediately took possession of it, dug a rifle pit on the highest point, and had no more trouble from that quarter. After about four hours of fighting, we began to press them back in all directions, and soon drove them off. About two o'clock, their fire slackened, and they withdrew into the hills, but many continued in sight on the bluffs until dark. In this day's fight, we had seven wounded, three of them seriously, and some horses and mules killed. The loss of the Indians must have been at least 30 in this engagement. Most of the officers and men estimate it to be much greater. It is impossible, however, to be certain as their dead and wounded are immediately carried off. Indeed, it is common for the warrior to be fastened to his horse so that his body will be brought off in case of accident. The number of warriors engaged was from 500 to 1,000, the latter, probably nearer the mark. They were armed with rifles, revolvers, bows, and arrows. Many were mounted on American horses, and there were white men or Mexicans among them. They had plenty of ammunition. Many balls were common, and they were bold and brave. They generally shot too high, else we should have suffered much more. Early in the engagement, I telegraphed to Major Thomas L. Mackey, commanding at Fort Laramie, to send down a field piece, it appearing difficult to dislodge the Indians from their sheltered positions without one. Directly afterward, the line was cut. About three o'clock, I sent a strong party to repair it. The break was found about a mile west and mended. Soon afterward, it was cut again. At dark, another party was sent out and found two poles cut down and the wire gone for four poles at or near the same place. By taking wire from the line east, it was repaired so that we were able to keep up communication with Fort Laramie. During the night, we fortified and prepared to take the offensive. In the morning, no Indians were in sight. Leaving Captain Fouts in command of the station, we reconnoitered in force ready to meet them and found the whole country covered with trails. They seemed to concentrate and tend generally towards the springs on Rush Creek about 10 miles distant and we satisfied ourselves that their main camp was there. Before daylight of the morning of the 8th, Lieutenant W.H. Brown, 11th Ohio Volunteer Cavalry, arrived with a howitzer having come from Fort Laramie in 34 hours, including stoppages. On the morning of the 8th, an expedition was organized for pursuit, Captain Fouts being left in command of the station. The country is very broken, and in Indian fighting, an attempt to surprise is always probable. The camp was found where we expected, at Rush Creek Springs. It was deserted, but there were evidences that it had been recently and hastily left, that they had been there about three days and were in great numbers. The camp covered several miles. Over 100 beef cattle had been slaughtered in it. Empty oyster, meat, and fruit cans were plenty. Flour sacks, a quantity of codfish, and indications of the spoils of ranches and trains were scattered everywhere. Quantities of meat cut up for use and skins pegged down for drying and tanning were left upon the ground. Pressing forwards on the now fresh trails in four or five miles, we reached the valley of the Platte, near the mouth of Rush Creek. When within a mile of the river, we came in sight of the Indians on the other side, scattered over the plains between the bluffs and the river, grazing their horses. There were no teepees or lodges, no travois or lodge poles, no women, children, or dogs in sight. They had all gone forward into the bluffs, which at this point are about five miles north of the river, leaving the warriors only behind. The lodge trails were very broad and fresh, apparently made that morning and the evening before. It was now clear we had underestimated the numbers against us. With a field glass they could be distinctly seen and examined. There were at least 2,000 warriors in sight. It was evident that all the hostile Indians that had been committing depredations and holding the country
country along the South Platte were concentrated here. The river was about a half a mile wide and frozen over. While we were looking for a crossing, they saved us the trouble by commencing to swarm down to the river banks and come over on the ice, not opposite, but one or two miles above and below us. We had barely time to corral our train before they were upon us on every side. The position chosen was the best we could get, but there were many little sand ridges and hollows under cover of which they could approach us. A very great challenge had come over the men since the morning of the fight at Mud Springs. They were rested and free from excitement, had confidence in their officers, obeyed orders, and went to work with a will. Sharpshooters were pushed out, and the hillocks commanding the camp occupied, and rifle pits dug upon them. The Indians of the plains are the best skirmishers in the world. In rapidity of movement, sudden wheeling and hanging over steep and difficult ground. No trained cavalry can equal them. Hunting the buffalo is the best possible school. We were not strong enough to charge or scatter. It was necessary to be prudent and at first take the defensive. They dashed up very boldly, but soon fell back from our bullets and resorted to their old game of skulking and sharpshooting. At this game, they were well met by our men. At one point, we were greatly annoyed by a party of 10 or 15 behind a little knoll about 400 yards distant. And and it became evident that they must be dislodged. A detail was made of 16 mounted men, part from the detachment of Company D, 7th Iowa Cavalry, and part from a detachment of the 1st Battalion, 11th Ohio Volunteer Cavalry. The party was placed in command of Lieutenant Patton, 11th Ohio Volunteer Cavalry, and he was ordered to charge at full speed, revolvers in hand, to clear out the Indians behind the hillock, and, having done so, wheel and return immediately. It was admirably done. The skulkers were routed and fled. In the meantime, there were from 150 to 200 Indians on the rising ground beyond the contested hillock, which was about midway between us and them. When they saw the charge, they swarmed down to save their men, and our party had a short hand-to-hand -hand fight with their advance, and then wheeled and returned as ordered. In this charge, we lost two men, Private John A. Harris, Company D, 7th Iowa Cavalry, who fell in the fight, and Private William H. Hartshorn, Company C, 11th Ohio Volunteer Cavalry, a veteran who was on a very spirited horse, and either his own ardor or inability to control his horse, or both, led him forward into the thickest of the Indians, and we saw him no more alive. Many Indians were killed and wounded in this charge. They fell immediately back before our fire as the charging party returned. A small party immediately went out and brought in the body of Harris. The Indians had no time to scalp him or take his arms or clothing, and they were brought in with him. The body of Hartshorn was found next morning about one mile from our camp, horribly mutilated, with 97 arrows sticking in it. It is not unlikely that some chief of note was killed by him, or someone else in the charge, and that each one of his relations and friends put an arrow in him and left it, as it is sometimes their custom. Both bodies were brought to Fort Laramie for burial. I desire especially to call attention to the conduct of Lieutenant Patton and his little body of men. The charge was a very gallant one, and the desired objects were fully accomplished. Toward night, we could not bring the Indians in reach of our fire. They retired behind the hills and were returning across the Platte until dark, when very few seemed to be on the south side of the river. About sundown, an incident worthy of notice occurred. Private Miller, Company C, 11th Ohio Volunteer Cavalry, had shot an Indian, and he lay on the ice in plain sight, about half a mile distant. Our enemies retreated, and night coming on, horses and mules were ordered to be watered, a few at a time, not in the river, but at the creek, which was the nearer. A party going by mistake towards the Platte, where the dead Indian lay, a cry was raised and the Indians on both sides came flocking to the point, evidently supposing that we were after the body. Recall was sounded. Our men came back and the Indians retired, but in the morning the body was gone. The Indians never permit their killed to fall into the hands of their enemies if it is possible to prevent it. We camped on the battleground and continued to prepare and occupy favorable positions during the night and morning. About sunrise on the 9th, they began to come over, above, and below, until some 400 mounted warriors were counted, without any apparent diminution of the number, left on the north side of the river. They found us ready, skirmished about for a while, exchanged a few shots, and then began to recross and put off rapidly for the bluffs. At noon, very few were to be seen. They were evidently hurrying away into the sand hills to overtake their families that had gone on the day before. A few scouts could be seen on the other side of the river, left to watch us, and when we moved up the river, we saw them, eight in number, crossing to our deserted camp like wolves to pick up something as a trophy 
or to dig up or scalp any dead they might find. Further pursuit would have been injudicious and useless. With their numbers, they could at any time compel our small party to corral and fight. We could drive them off and follow again with the same result, but could not afford to give them the least advantage. In following them to Lo Kikur, we should be in the sand hills, when they would have had greatly the advantage in ground and where our stock could not subsist. In each engagement, the Indians fired everything around them that would burn. We continued to see the smoke of their fires as they went north for at least 50 miles. We broke camp about 2 o'clock, moved up the Platte about 15 miles where the command was divided, part under Lieutenant Brown, 11th Ohio Volunteer Cavalry, going on to Camp Mitchell and Fort Laramie, which had been left with insufficient garrisons, and the remainder returning to Mud Springs with me. On the morning of the 10th, I took about 75 men and proceeded to Pole Creek to open communication with Julesburg. At Pole Creek, we met Captain Wilcox, 7th Iowa Cavalry, with his command, repairing the line. On the 11th, we started to return to Fort Laramie, made Pumpkin Creek, 10 miles west of Mud Springs that night. On the 12th, made Camp Mitchell, 45 miles, and on the 14th, reached Fort Laramie, 50 miles. We found the Pole Creek Station burned, and between that point and Mud Springs, the poles were gone for 10 miles and a half consecutively. East of Pole Creek Station, they were reported gone for a still greater distance. The Indians had evidently good teachers and did their work well. They have got over their superstitious idea that it is bad medicine to touch the telegraph. Of the conduct of the officers and men connected with the expedition, I cannot speak too highly. In extreme cold weather, in the dead of winter, the main body marched nearly 400 miles in 10 days, much of the time by night, without tents or shelter, camped on the ground, often without fire, on short rations and forage, and met and repulsed in every engagement a brave and cunning foe, numbering at least 10, probably 15 to 1. Their patience and endurance, their cheerfulness and courage, their readiness to obey, and promptness and skill to execute could not be surpassed. The expedition was organized into four squadrons, the first composed of a detachment from Company D, 7th Iowa Cavalry, the second of a detachment from Company I, 11th Ohio Volunteer Cavalry, the third of of a detachment from Company H, 11th Ohio Volunteered Cavalry, the fourth of a detachment composed of men from Companies A, B, C, and D of the 1st Battalion, 11th Ohio Volunteer Cavalry, and the howitzer in charge of Lieutenant Brown, commanding a squad of men, 11th Ohio Volunteer Cavalry, sufficient to man the peace. All did their duty well, and I do not feel at liberty to particularize, except in the case of Lieutenant Patton and his party. Their charge was a very brilliant affair, challenged and received universal praise. The howitzer, under command of Lieutenant Brown, was admirably served, but did not prove as useful as was expected, owing to the defective character of the ammunition, many of the shells failing to burst at all and some bursting at the muzzle of the gun. I append the report of Lieutenant Brown upon the subject and ask that proper steps be taken to condemn such of our ammunition as is worthless or doubtful and that better be furnished to the troops stationed in the mountains. Much of the howitzer ammunition at Fort Laramie has been in the magazine for eight or ten years. All supplies for this service should be of the best quality as they are forwarded but once in the year and mistakes cannot be seasonably corrected. The casualties attending the expedition were much fewer than could have been anticipated. It arises from the fact that the Indians, when near us, fired too high, not understanding their new arms and ammunition, and that our men obeyed orders, fought systematically, and manifested great prudence and adroitness in imitating the Indian cunning. Moving and fighting in the Indian country is a distinct branch of the service that few understand and that can only be learned by actual service. In the engagement at Mud Springs, three men were wounded seriously and four slightly. In the battle at the mouth of Rush Creek, two men were killed, nine wounded. In addition to this, ten men were seriously frostbitten in our night marches, making a total of 28 killed and disabled. The total loss of the Indians in all the engagements is variously estimated from 100 to 150. And as to casualties, also his supplemental report detailing the brutalities inflicted upon the body of Private W.H. Hartshorn, Company C. It is well to know the character of the enemy we have to deal with. This party of Indians has rarely been equaled in size. It is usually difficult for large numbers to remain long together for lack of subsistence, but in this case their stolen stock and plundered stores 
furnished them abundant supplies. The party was made up of all of the Cheyennes, Ogallalas, and Brule Sioux south of the Platte, together with probably a few Kiowas, Arapahoes, and perhaps some straggling Apaches and Comanches. It numbered from 800 to 1,000 lodges and from 2,000 to 3,000 warriors. The last named bands are most likely on the south of the Arkansas River for the winter, but many come up to depredate on the main and south Platte when grass comes. The party we met has no doubt gone north to the Powder River country to join the hostile Indians there and may be expected to continue their depredations along the North Platte till severely punished. Their probable route from where we left them will be through the sand hills to Lo Kikur, then across the heads of the White River and the South Fork of Cheyenne to Powder River. Small parties may remain, but the main body will go there to secure their families and recruit their stock until spring. They are well armed and mounted, have many rifled muskets and plenty of ammunition, including many cartridges with ounce balls, are full of venom and bent on revenge for the loss of their people south. So soon as they reach the Indians north, they will excite and perhaps compel them to become hostile. The posts on the Platte, especially Deer Creek and Platte Bridge, which are within 100 miles of Powder River, will be in immediate danger. More troops should be sent out here immediately to hold the posts in the sub-district, and when spring opens, important expeditions should be organized to penetrate the center of their country. Having been nearly three years in this service and being about to leave it, I venture to add a word as to the policy to be pursued. I beg to repeat the suggestions which I have heretofore made, that the permanent cure for the hostilities of the northern Indians is to go into the heart of their buffalo country and build and hold forts till the trouble is over. A hasty expedition, however successful, is only a temporary lesson whereas the presence of troops in force in the country where the Indians are compelled to live and subsist would soon oblige them to sue for peace and accept such terms as the government may think proper to impose. The Black Hills, Bighorn Mountain, Yellowstone Country are all rich in minerals, but this wealth cannot be made available while hostile bands of Indians are roaming over the country. If these Indians could be induced to remove north towards the main Missouri and remain there, it would open up an immense region for mining and agriculture which cannot be now now reached. They would be in a fine buffalo country and out of the way of collisions with the whites, which are always liable to occur if they are near together. It would also separate them from the southern Indians and prevent the plotting and combining which now exists between them. There are two points I would respectfully indicate as suitable locations for the posts spoken of. One about the head of the Little Missouri of the Mandans near the Three Buttes, and the other at some proper place on Powder River. An expedition starting from the Missouri near Fort Pierre and following the old traders' trail west of the forks of the Cheyenne, thence to the head of the Little Missouri of the Mandans, thence to Powder River, would be joined at some proper post by another from Fort Laramie, and, if in sufficient force, it could hardly fail to accomplish its object. I am, Captain, your very obedient servant, William O. Collins. All right, and there you have it, uh, an extensive report of the Battle of Mud Springs uh, that talks about Julesburg and, and the uh, depredations that the natives had along the Overland Trails that William O'Collins was in charge of. And one thing that's interesting, I mean, just, just, I mean, trying to put yourself in the shoes of this battlefield report is that, I mean, number one, this happened in February. It was freezing cold. These guys were sleeping out on the, you know, frozen tundra of the, you know, of the plains. Uh, and they, you know, they fought the natives uh, and, you know, and he describes how they fought. Uh, but I mean, especially covering the mileage that they covered overnight uh, along the Overland Trails is, is pretty crazy. So hope you enjoyed it. If you did, let me know. It's a different way of, of doing videos. Uh, obviously, it's all audio, you know, reading the, the battlefield report or, or the, you know, the report that was sent in to his higher ups. But I uh, hope this is worthwhile. Please comment below. What was your either favorite part of the report or more importantly, what surprised you most about the actions taken by William O'Collins, the 11th Ohio, and the other regiments during the you know, February of 1865. Please comment below, uh, like us on Facebook, please like us as well uh, on, on YouTube here, ring the notification bell, and of course, until we see you again, ride hard.